Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Halton Garden Week 2022. My name is Helen Stevenson. I'm the program manager at Halton Food. In the background, we have Andrea Rowe of Sustainable and the director of Sustainable Environments at Halton Environmental Network, and Dara, who's with Open Doors in Burlington. Dara Kavanagh. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank one of our many sponsors for this event, uh, the Oakville Horticultural Society. The Oakville Horticultural Society is generously giving away a free uh, membership to their society tonight. And though I know everybody doesn't live within driving distance of Oakville, we are gonna have this draw. So if you would like to enter, please just send me a private direct message using the chat function down below. You'll see the icons and there's a chat function. And my name again was Helen with Halton Food in brackets. Just direct message me if you'd like to be entered in that draw and I'll do a random draw at the end of the night. So tonight we are very pleased to welcome Lisa uh, Uterkamp. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> oh, sorry. Lisa is a graduate of landscape architecture from the University of Guelph and has studied at Niagara Park School of Horticulture. She has worked for Landscape Ontario and now enjoys teaching green industries and horticulture classes in high school. So tonight, Lisa will be sharing her knowledge on edible perennials in our landscape. Thank you very much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen, and, and welcome to everybody who just tuned in on, I believe it's Thursday. Um, so, so excited to be with you all today for this presentation. And as Helen mentioned, I am extremely passionate about edible perennial plants. Um, not only are they great for our environment, being a perennial, um, but they also have a function. So they serve as a way to engage people in horticulture who may otherwise perhaps are not quote unquote plant people. Um, so one of my missions in life is to try to convert as many people to become plant people and see the value and joys in plants. Um, so today I have a presentation on ed edible perennial plants, and we'll be going through three different topics, um, tasty trails, so different perennials that you can find um, on your walks or hikes. We'll do edible plants for the garden and edible weeds. Um, and we'll start with, I'll do a brief introduction as well. Um, but if you have any questions throughout this presentation, um, hopefully it can be a, a dialogue and a starting place where we can continue to explore um, different edible plants because by no means do I know all the edible plants out there, um, nor do I know all the different uses and recipes for them. So if you have any edible plants that you'd like to share or recipes that you'd like to share, please, please, please type them in the chat and same with any questions. Okay. So I thought we'd start with an introduction. Um, before I was able to sort of see everybody and we'd all do a round table introduction, but I think our group is too big to do that today. So I'll do a brief introduction, um, but think of your own introduction at this point, specifically um, your favorite edible plant. So um, as I mentioned, my name is Lissa. I graduated at Niagara Park School of Horticulture um, and attended uh, Guelph University for Landscape Architecture, and I'm super passionate about plants. Um, and my most recent favorite edible plant uh, would have to be the hardy kiwi plant. Um, this plant I stumbled upon in a garden center, and it's absolutely amazing. It's a vine. I'll talk about it a little bit later, um, so you can use it growing up the side of a building, um, you can espaliate it or trellis it, um, and you get these tiny grape-sized kiwis from it. And then different varieties also have these beautiful pink-tipped leaves. Oh, my apologies. Sorry, I gotta go all the way back to the beginning. I hit the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so, We'll start off with tasty trails. So what plants can you find when you're hiking um, at your local conservation area or at a natural area, perhaps near your house? Um, hopefully we'll get to, to hiking soon enough. So I have two plants in this topic. 
Um, there are definitely more plants, a lot of which are ephemeral, um, but I haven't included those plants because these ephemeral plants, um, very easily they can be over harvested and over picked. Um, so I didn't want to necessarily share that um, today, but there are some ephemeral plants. So plants that only come up for a very short amount of time before dying down in the spring um, that are also edible. So the first one I wanted to talk about was the wild grape. The botanical name is Vitis. Um, and there's multiple different species of grape. Um, so different options there. But the wild grape has, I think it's underrepresented as a, uh, a wild edible plant because not only can you eat the berries um, and you can use the berries in things such as um, eating them raw or you can juice them, but you can also eat the leaves of these plant when they're young. And you can make a food dolmenads um, by filling the young leaves with meat and then steaming them. Um, or you can fill it with nuts, berries, and rice as well. So this is, the wild grape is a deciduous woody vine. It's about three to nine feet tall and wide, but it can get much larger. Um, the berries turn from a green to sort of this dark blue with a little bit of a film on it. Um, and you'll see in the image here, it has a toothed leaf with three main points. Um, and when I say tooth, I mean that the margin of the leaf, which is the outside of the leaf, has sort of these spikes or these teeth on it. If you think of uh, sort of those scissors that you used to cut with when you were young, that's what the edge of this leaf looks like. Um, the reason I go into this so deeply is because there's a lookalike for this plant. And it's called common moon seed. Um, and this plant looks similar. It's in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, so it looks similar. It's got these three primary points, same as our wild grape, um, but the margin, the outside of the leaf is completely smooth. Um, and we don't wanna mistake the two. They both have berries. Their flowers are completely different, however. Um, but common moon seed, you should not eat those. Um, the berries are mildly toxic, um, whereas wild grape, they're completely fine to eat. So that's the difference between the two. Um, this plant is native to, or it can grow in USDA hardiness zones six to nine. Um, so we should find it all around our areas here. Um, and the berries ripen around August, August, September. Um, so we won't see the berries for a while, but this spring, um, while you're out hiking, take a look for this three lobed toothed leaf and you can pick a couple and make your own dolmenads. Um, so that is the wild grape or vitis species. Um, if you did want to bring a grape into your own personal landscape, um, there's cool opportunities to include grapevines sort of um, trellis or on a trellis. So growing over a trellis and then creating a shaded seating area beneath it. Um, but you can also use it as a fence or a barrier. Um, so you can put stakes in, run wire along it, and then train your grapevine on that wire. And you will need to prune this plant. Okay. Um, so I will say that I can't see the chat. Um, so Helen is monitoring the chat. So if you do have questions, please do type them in. Um, and then Helen will just let me know if there's any questions. So that is our grape. We have uh, just a comment. Um, yeah. So we have a attendee here today who is talking about when they were a child, they were introduced to ground cherries found on walks in, um, in the Georgian Bay area and found them very tart and delicious. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. I was also recently introduced, or I guess I wasn't introduced as a child, but I discovered them later on and they are deliciously tart. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Now, I, I thought the wild grape was um, invasive. Is it not or is that? 
Yes. So it, it is. And um, that's why there's no issue in picking it. Okay. So I won't share plants that if you were to pick it, you might wipe out its entire population, um, such as trout lily. Trout lily is one of those ephemeral plants where it's only really got one to two leaves. You pick the leaf to eat it and you might completely decimate that small population. Um, so yeah, this plant, you if you do plant it, probably don't, but you'll see it on your trails. So as you hike, odds are it'll be there. Um, but it's sort of like the weeds that will be coming to later. You can easily harvest this plant and not be concerned because it's a vigorous grower. So it will come back um, and we don't necessarily uh, need more of it in our landscape. So yeah, you're hundred percent correct, Helen. Thank you. Um, so this is our next plant that you might find hiking. Um, and this plant here is a staghorn sumac. Botanical name is Rus or Rus typhina. Um, it's a deciduous shrub or small tree. It's sort of on the border. Um, deciduous meaning it drops its leaves in the fall and winter. Um, it's got these long pinnately compound leaves. And what I mean by that is there's these small leaflets on the petiole of the leaf. Um, and the leaves turn brilliant, brilliant red in the fall. It's, it's a stunning plant. Um, the fruit of this plant is also stunning. Um, it's sort of this tall red pinnacle full of seeds. Um, and it's got sort of a fuzzy texture to it. Um, this plant can grow 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, and you'll see it growing. Sometimes it'll be planted on slopes, um, but you'll see it growing in a lot of different areas in full sun. Um, but it's planted on slopes as a landscape use um, because its root system um, forms a network of fibrous roots underground. And the reason why landscape architects and landscape designers would plant Ruth or Russ Typhena or Staghorn Sumac or any sumac is because it helps to stabilize the soil on slopes. So it does amazing things to prevent erosion, um, especially along uh, stream banks. So it provides a little bit of an ecosystem service there. This plant is native to zones or USDA zones three to eight. So again, we'll find it growing um, in a lot of our areas. Um, it, it is a bit of an aggressive spreader. I wouldn't recommend, similar to the previous plant, I wouldn't recommend planting it um, unless you have a really big space. I've seen it planted along the Niagara Parkway aesthetically, um, but the reason I don't recommend it for most backyards is because it spreads underground via rhizomes. So coming off the roots, so it spreads um, quite a lot and you would have to keep on top of it for pruning. Um, there are different types of sumac, like fragrant sumac, that you'll see very commonly used in landscapes, but it doesn't have this same fruit um, here. And so coming to the fruit, coming to the edible qualities of this plant. Um, this fruit, you can actually make lemonade out of. And so in order to make lemonade, what you would do is you'd harvest this fruit, August to September, you'd have to get it before the birds get to it. Um, so you'd harvest this fruit and to make the lemonade, you would pour cool to lukewarm water over top of the, um, the staghorn sumac berries and let it soak. Um, a lot of people recommend letting it soak overnight. Um, and that's what I do as well. I let it soak overnight because then you get the richest flavor. You don't want to boil the water and pour it over top of this, this fruit um, because it'll release some tannins and it'll taste very, very bitter. Um, so once you soak this fruit in cold to lukewarm water, soak it overnight, then the following day, you'll strain it through a cloth um, to get all, out all the little berries. And you can see they've got tiny little 
bits of fuzz on them as well. Um, so you want to strain all of that out. And then it's a very tart taste, this lemonade. Um, so you can add sugar or honey to it to make it um, sweet, like lemonade, if you like. Um, but this plant, um, nice tart taste, high in vitamin C, um, and just a very nice summer refreshing drink. Um, so that is our staghorn sumac, where if you find it on your trails, uh, August to September, it might provide a nice beverage for you when you get home. Any questions about the staghorn sumac? Uh, we do have one. Uh, yeah. One of our participants said it is a favorite with deer, their findings. So can you comment to that? Yes. <laughs> um, I, when we, when I was at the botanical gardens there, um, the deer didn't go after our sumac because we had more tasty things. Um, not that you want to plant more tasty things for them to eat. Um, but we found they went after the, uh, the tulip bulbs, the hostas, all our evergreens. Um, so we didn't have a huge, huge issue. I do know that at the parks, they tried to deter deer. They used sort of dogs roaming around. Um, I think at one point they spread coyote pee, which is not practical for the average homeowner. Um, you could try netting it if, if you have it on your personal property. Um, but unfortunately, if it is on a trail, um, you'll, you'll have to either let the animals have it or try to watch it carefully if you're walking there every day and, and beat the animals to the punch for this one. Uh, and then we have a question, uh, is there a danger of mixing up sumac species? There is a poisonous sumac. Yes, so there is a poisonous sumac and I have that here. Um, so the poison sumac has white berries, not red. Um, that grow downwards um, instead of upwards in a red cone. Um, and poison sumacs typically are found in swampy uh, areas. Um, so yeah, you don't, it'll, you don't want to go for the white buried sumac. That is the poison one. Awesome comment. Okay. Good tip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's it for the sumacs. Fantastic. Okay, so the next plants I have here, these are plants that I'm growing in my garden. And um, I just think they're slightly underrated uh, perennial plants that um, you can grow in your garden and, and sort of benefit uh, from the fruits of your labor through their fruits. Um, so the first one I want to talk about, and I'm curious if anybody else is growing these, um, is gooseberries. Um, so uh, rabies or rabies, um, uva crispa is the species of it. Um, and there's multiple different species of gooseberries as well. Um, but this plant here, it's a deciduous shrub. It grows about two to five feet tall and it looks almost identical to a currant. Um, it's got a woody stem. Um, the big difference is currants don't have thorns. Unfortunately, this plant does have small thorns on it, um, but the berries of this plant are very diverse. They can get to be the size of grapes, um, but they can also get to become a little bit larger. There were actually competitions um, back in the mid 19th century on uh, how big you could grow your gooseberries. So similar to our pumpkin growing competitions. And um, there's a record of a gooseberry grown to about the size of a hen's egg, which is a very big um, size for a berry. Um, most gooseberries, however, are about the size of grapes um, that you might find at a grocery store. And so uh, gooseberries can come in green, red, purple, and yellow. Um, the, the bush itself, the woody deciduous shrub, is um, hardy to zones four to six. So again, it should you should be able to grow it um, in most of the areas that we're coming from, unless you're tuning in from way up north. Um, you can eat these berries raw. You can uh, make them into jams. You could bake them into pear pastries, pardon me. They are delightful. Um, they are tart to the taste, similar to a currant, um, but unlike a currant, they're a little bit more sizable, so they're easier to pick. 
um, than currants and uh, easier to eat just by the handful than currants as well. So these plants, if you do wanna plant it in your backyard, you'll need a full sun location. Um, you'll like clay to loamy soil is ideal. Like it does like a little bit of moisture around it. Um, and you do wanna prune it, not necessarily every year, but it does tend to grow into itself a little bit and the brush, br ugh, pardon me, branches will begin to cross. Um, and so what pruning it does is it opens it up. So you wanna prune it into a vase shape. Um, and this helps to prevent things such as powdery mildew by increasing the airflow through the shrub. Um, so this plant, once you've planted it, it will probably take maybe three years before you'll see any berries. Um, but the gooseberries that I have, and this is a picture of my little gooseberry patch back here, um, they become absolutely loaded with gooseberries. We get so many gooseberries off these bushes. It's phenomenal. Um, and you'll harvest these berries late June, early July. Um, and yeah, they're, they're absolutely delightful. And we make gooseberry jam each year to account for the large number of gooseberries that we have. So that's all I've got on gooseberries. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, we do. And by the way, uh, people are absolutely loving this presentation because there's lots of lots of comments. So I'm just rhyming off the questions for you, but there's lots of yeah. wonderful feedback as well. Uh, awesome. Someone asked, is it the tannins that are the thing we want to avoid? So this is going back to the sumacs um, yeah. when you're pouring the boiling water on the staghorn sumac, or is there something else you're trying to avoid when you're using? So not yeah, in the water because of the tannins, but is there any other reason? Yeah, it's primarily the tannins. And um, I'm not a food scientist, so I can't confirm this, but I have read too that pouring boiling water over it uh, reduces some of the nutritional value of it as well. But again, I'm not a food scientist. I haven't done the actual test to confirm that, um, but that's another reason in addition to the tannins. Awesome. And now going to the gooseberry questions. Um, we have someone who said they used to fight through the thorns as a kid and make a type of gooseberry lemonade with it, which I think is like, aren't they quite tart, the gooseberries? Yes. Yeah, they are. They're very tart. And uh, oh, gooseberry lemonade. I haven't tried that, but I definitely will now. But yeah, sometimes you have to get through the thorns a little bit and uh, they are a little bit tart. Cool thing with making jam out of it. You don't actually need pectin when you make jam, um, the gooseberries sort of solidify themselves. So your real, your only additive is really a little bit of lemon juice and a lot of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there any native gooseberries to Southern Ontario? I'm getting that question. I can't think of, yeah, and my apologies, it's my presentation doesn't have purely native plants. Um, so my apologies there. I don't believe so, but I would have to research that. Okay. And um, there's just comments that, you know, if you're from anywhere in the British Isles, this would be a very familiar fruit. Um, yeah, somebody said prickly gooseberry, they believe is one of those. Um, somebody has gooseberries in their fridge, uh, which they're calling the uh, uh, the combination of a fruit hedge. So I think we, we've called them fedges before when we've talked about that. So they also have haskets, currants, rhubarb, wild grape, and black and red raspberries in their, what they're calling their fridge. So I think, Heather, you need to get in touch with us because we're growing a food forest and we're including all those things, but I'll, I'll let uh, Lisa comment on that. <laughs> that sounds like the most delightful garden ever. And I like the food hedges. That's fantastic. Gooseberries would definitely play a fantastic role, given they've got a little bit of a prickly quality to them. They're a nice, sturdy shrub. Um, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Amazing comments. Thank you. And um, yeah, definitely awesome to share all those things that you're able to grow. And sometimes if they have an issue with soft fly caterpillars eating all the gooseberry leaves, do you have a solution for that? Um, I might have to circle back to that. Um, we had a lot of other pests. I'm not sure if like row cover cloth, cloths might be okay for that, but I haven't had that um, issue myself. We 
ours, knock on wood, have been relatively pest free. Um, so I'd have to, to circle back to that. Oh, and she did mean fed. It was a, an autocorrect. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which times does that happen to me? Yep. <laughs> Um, and then somebody commented that they've had gooseberry fool, which is a lovely dessert. Well, they're not really saying it's a lovely dessert. They're just saying it's a dessert, but I'm assuming it's a dessert. So therefore it's lovely. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And it'd be cool too. Yeah. If you have any recipes or, or things that you've had, like share it in the chat and then people can um, copy and paste them and try them when gooseberries are ready for the pickings. All right. Um, all right. And so we just have comments on a Carolinian food forest with some cultivated. Um, oh, a fool is a lot of a lot of whipped cream in a fool. All right. <laughs> okay, I think we can start on uh, the next one, which I recognize this one, but take it away. <laughs> yeah. So most of you are probably familiar with this plant. Um, this is a blueberry shrub or blueberry bush, uh, the vicinium species. There's so many different species of blueberries now. So you can get blueberries um, ready to fruit and pick at different times of the year. It's a deciduous shrub again. There's high, high bush blueberries and there's low bush blueberries. So different sizes of the plant as well. Um, you do need a male and female blueberry plant in order to produce fruit. Some nurseries are working on hybridizing them, so you might find a, a very special hybrid um, that has two in one qualities, both fit male and female. But if you get a regular high bush or regular low bush blueberry, um, then you do want the male and female in order to produce the fruit. Um, blueberries, again, um, we're probably a little bit more on the edge of their growing zone. They are hiring this zone five to eight. Um, you all know you can have blueberries raw, bake them in pastries, make jam out of them, make pies, absolutely delightful. But how do we grow them? Um, so blueberries, I've been growing in my backyard and I've had, like, I struggle with blueberries because they require such acidic soil. Um, so I sort of move my, have moved my blueberries around and now I've found a patch in my yard that they are the happiest. They're doing well, they're sending out new growth um, and I'm getting many more blueberries from them. Um, so when I say acidic soil, I mean it's lower on the pH scale and you can test your soil. There's like tests that you can buy from Home Depot or Canadian Tire to test the pH of your soil. Um, in order to make your soil more acidic, um, you can amend it. Um, it is hard and it takes multiple years to amend your soil. Um, so different ways of amending your soil, you could add peat moss, um, well composted compost or compost tea, um, mulch the area with pine needles or choose an area where you already have a pine tree growing and then move it just a little bit out so it gets the sun. Um, and then there is a, like, you could use the chemical aluminum sulfate and mix that into the top layer of the soil. Um, but you do want to be careful with that because um, it is a chemical. So if you have pets or young children, you don't want them uh, sort of near there. But those are different ways that you can increase the acidity of your soil. Um, blueberry plants like full sun to part shade, and you're harvesting them in July to August. And the biggest reason I included this as a landscape plant, um, because I think if you can get the soil, this plant is beautiful on its own. There's different types of blueberry bushes. This blueberry in the bottom right corner, very, very shiny leaf. So why, why do we plant boxwoods um, when we can get that same beautiful shine from a shrub um, that produces berries for us to eat? And then the leaves also go bright, bright red in the fall. Absolutely spectacular fall color. Um, so you get this beautiful foliage in the spring, you get berries um, July to August, and then August to September, pardon me, you get brilliant, brilliant red leaves. Um, so that's why I love the blueberry and encourage if you can get the soil right, um, definitely a plant to try out in your own yards. Okay, that's what I have for blueberries. If you have any questions, comments, ideas, suggestions, um, feel free to type them in the chat. Right. 
So we have one, they just wanted clarification. So do blueberries definitely need a male and a female to get the berry? Yes, but some nurseries, um, the plant that you buy, they've hybridized it. So the plant has both male and female parts to the flowers. Okay, so it's taking care of that for you. Yeah, um, so just read the tag when you purchase it to make sure if it's just um, male or just female, the females are the one that produce the fruit. Um, make sure it says it has both. If not, you'll need two. Okay. And someone else commented that I think generally Southern Ontario doesn't have acidic soil around Lake Ontario. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. And that's why I've struggled so hard with the blueberry um, because Northern Ontario, you go further north and you see a lot more coniferous trees. You see a lot um, more of our white pine trees that produce that acidic type soil. And we've got higher bedrock um, and different type of bedrock to produce that acidic soil. So it is, um, that's the biggest thing. You have to either have that spot in your yard already. Maybe you've had pine trees growing there for years and years and years, and it slowly created its own little um, soil niche that's more acidic, um, or you might have to work in that peat um, to help acidify the soil. But yeah, it is, that is the, the hardest bit is to, to get that soil to where Northern Ontario has it a little bit easier. I guess that leads to the next question though. Is it easier to grow blueberry bushes in pots then? Yeah, yeah, you can grow them in pots. I would recommend that you bury your pot in the winter just to protect the roots. Like it still needs that cold period. Um, but just dig a hole somewhere in your, your garden just to sink the pot in over the winter. So the roots that are on the edge of the pot, they don't um, essentially freeze and die. Um, and that answers actually the next question was, uh, can they be left out in the winter or should they come back into the garage? But uh, I think you answered that there. Yeah. Um, so how, somebody wants to know, how exactly does the tag say if it's male or female or will they just say self? pollinating yeah it'll say self-pollinating yeah. um all right uh a horticultural course um i did seem to say to not bother trying growing acidic soil um because trying acidic loving plants and soils that aren't naturally acidic it doesn't seem it seems to be a bit of a struggle so it ends up being you know too much of a constantly adding constantly working it all the rest of it so I think that that might be true and that's I think where you bring in the pots where it might be a little bit easier to control that. yes yeah. for sure it, it is definitely a struggle amending soil is no easy task um, it's one of those plants where yeah if you can grow it in a pot bury the pot um, that's a good option um, I yeah I guess for me personally I just really love the fall color and so, so I do, I put in that work to amend the soil. Um, but yeah, it is, it, you're, you're fighting our natural soil structure on this one for sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. And uh, well, I think we're all uh, hanging on to which, what's gonna be the next one here. <laughs> yeah. This plant you're bringing up. So this one is my favorite. Um, it's probably my favorite because it's sort of the least common. I had never really heard of it. And then again, I was perusing through a garden center and uh, I found this plant and I was like, a kiwi, you can grow kiwis here? No, that can't be. Those are, kiwis are for Australia. Um, so this is the hardy kiwi, Actinidia aruga, aruta, uh, pardon me. And it is, um, a deciduous vine, so it does drop its leaves. It grows up to 20 to 30 feet tall. Um, it does need a support structure. So this is my yard here again, and I have it growing up sort of this, this six by six. And then I've strung guide wire sort of between to espaliate it. Um, so it, it'll coil, similar to how a bean will coil. That's sort of how it wraps. It doesn't have the tiny little roots like English ivy does. Um, so the hardy kiwi is native to zones four to nine, um, other kiwis, nine plus, 
Um, so this kiwi, it's not your typical fuzzy brown fruit uh, that we see at the grocery store. It's these itty bitty tiny, but very cute and very tasty um, greenish to yellowish berries as they ripen. They're about the size of grapes, um, but the skin is completely edible. So you don't have to worry about cutting and, and spooning out your kiwi. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a cool vine. It's got beautiful leaves. It's got sort of these bright red petioles on the leaf. Um, and yeah, you can grow, up, grow it as a vine. It does need full sun. And you do need to prune it back to help it fruit a little bit more. Um, so I've been pruning it back um, when doing some research. I've been pruning it back to the main stem and then out about eight buds. Um, so sometimes when you prune roses, you prune about five to seven buds, depending on the health of the bud. Um, so for this kiwi, you're pruning it, you find your main stem, and then you're pruning back to about eight buds. So you have eight new growing areas the following year. Um, and you prune it to thin it, prevent overcrowding. Um, and so more sun can actually access the berries to help them ripen. Um, it does like well-drained soil. So if you have slightly sandier soil, I have it on a bit of a slope here. So the water just sort of runs around and past it, um, but it does need a structure. So it could be a lattice, a pergola, wires, um, and yeah, that's the hardy pe ki kiwi, pardon me. Um, it does need male to female, but this one again, when I bought it, it said self pollinates. So they've bred it to be a hybrid. Um, and you're harvesting this fruit in late August um, is when these tiny little berries will become edible. Um, there was another kiwi plant that I showed on my very first introduction slide. And it has same family, Actinidia, um, but the leaves look like they're dipped in pink paint. Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, plant. That one, and I might butcher the pronunciation, Kolomokitia, K-O-L-O-M-I-K-T-A. Um, this plant is also a kiwi, hardy to the area. I didn't include it here because it doesn't have, doesn't produce those readily edible fruits, um, but beautiful, beautiful pink tip leaves, which is something that we don't commonly see in our landscape. So yeah, that is our hardy kiwi plant. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, well, no, one person's just to comment that they think their yeah. female plant died last year, so no fruit this year, uh, but just, they agree it's a very tough plant. So uh, well recommended. And do the kiwis taste like kiwi or is it? Yeah, yeah. They have a slightly different texture. Like when, when you eat store kiwi, it's almost slightly like it's mushier textured. This is, um, it's still got that, but because it's so small, you don't notice that texture as much. But yeah, it's a similar tarty, but sweet taste. All right, got to give that a try. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody wants to know if the plant isn't very healthy, do you plan, prune it back harder? So back to seven or six buds compared to the nine or 10 you recommended. Hmm. I would try to find out what you think is causing the health concerns. I wouldn't necessarily prune it back too, too hard. Um, maybe it's not getting enough sun. Um, maybe it's sitting in too much water. Um, I would see if you could find another possible cause before trying to prune it back too hard. I'd just be worried that if it was followed by a really cold winter, um, that it might be um, too much stress. Right, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, this is another common plant. Um, it's an apple, malice species, but I put species there because um, you can, it's sort of like Frankensteining plants together. Um, growers have grafted multiple different cultivars and varieties of one genus, so malice, the genus, apple, um, onto one plant. And so I, I included this apple here um, because if you have a small yard, but you still want a fruit tree, um, you can find these sort of um, 
Frankenstein, I, Frankenstein is not a great word, um, but these multi-grafted stem apple trees. And you can either grow it as a tree or what I've done here in my front yard, because I didn't have enough room in the backyard, was I espaliated it, um, meaning I trained it on wires or guide wires um, stretched between two four by four posts. And so the wires are nice and tight. Um, and as the, the tree grows, I'll just use a tiny little piece of twine to loosely tie that branch onto the guide wire. Um, and then I'll prune it. So I'll prune it back to the bud to make sure the next bud faces straight up or the next bud will follow a different wire. Um, so this apple tree here has four different varieties of apple on it. Um, and by espaliating it and having multiple varieties, you get multiple different flavors um, and you get fruit in sort of a, uh, within a minimal space. So if you have a smaller yard, but you still get the sun that an apple tree would need, um, you can still reap the benefits of it. And of course you would harvest apples in August so to September, depending on the variety. The cool thing about this tree here is your harvest period is actually prolonged because different varieties harvest at different times. Um, so instead of getting all your apples all at once and being inundated with one type of apple, you get a few apples from a few of the branches, then you wait, and then the next branches will start to pr uh, produce after that. Um, so a pretty cool thing. I have found that I do get insects attacking this tree. So we have sprayed it a little bit. Um, but we're trying to use sort of organic sprays for it. And that is the apple and, uh, but sort of the, the different grafted type apple. So someone's just asking about the organic spray you use. How many times do you do that? And what is that organic spray? Um, I'd have to go to my garage. <laughs> I can't remember it off the top of my head. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. I have to say, I love how you uh, espaliate that tree. Like mine is way overgrown and is absolutely enormous and needs a very hard uh, pruning and cut back. So I, I love what you've done here. And it works as a bit of a privacy fence too. It does, yeah. We, we get these sort of tour buses that go down to the water every so often. So we put it up. So it sort of, yeah, acts as a privacy. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, this you might know, it's a native, it's our, our native fruit tree. Um, it, it's part of the Carolinian forest. It is a pawpaw tree. Um, so you re might recognize this, uh, this plant, this fruiting tree, or you might not, maybe it's new to you. Um, so Asimina triloba. Triloba is because it's got sort of three leaves uh, per or three fruits pardon me, uh, per cluster. Um, and this is, the pawpaw is a deciduous tree. It's not a huge tree, but it can get big, uh, about 15 to 30 feet tall. Um, it has these very cool purple flowers and large, smooth, tropical looking leaves. It's, it's got great uh, foliage that, that makes me feel like I'm in the tropics. Um, and when you open up the fruit, it'll also make you feel like you're in the tropics. So the fruit of this plant is completely edible. It does have these large pits that you have to remove. They're the black pits in the image. Um, and it tastes somewhat between a pineapple and a banana. If you can sort of like imagine making a pineapple banana smoothie, um, that's sort of the taste of this plant. It's uh, hardy to zones five to nine. It's native um, to North America, so a great native plant. Um, and you can eat the fruit raw in smoothies. Um, a very cool thing for kids to propagate too. You can take the seeds and try to propagate it. You do need to keep them in the fridge to give them that cold period though. Um, so you can grow it as a backyard tree. Um, and this one is interesting. So black walnut um, releases juglins. Um, a toxin underground, and this plant is tolerant. So if you have a black walnut tree in your yard and it's um, sort of harming your other plants by releasing this underground toxin, um, the, the pawpaw tree is not affected by black walnuts. Um, care for this plant. This plant does sucker. 
um, meaning it sends up new sprouts from the base. Um, and you do want to put it in a full sun, part shade location. Um, it's, it's sort of an understory tree being a little bit shorter, but it, it does still need some sun for the fruit to ripen. And then you would harvest this fruit in late August. And that is the Asimina triloba, the pawpaw tree. And it's fun to say. Well, it seems a number of people have this in their yard because they're all uh, offering their opinion of what they think it tastes like. So some people said a little bit of a cross with a mango as well. Um, yeah. There been questions about where to find a pop-off fruit and people have been going back and forth saying you really have to check with your farmer's market. And I think, um, I'm not sure who said it, I'm looking back. It does not travel well, as somebody said. Uh, it's something that you do, are not gonna find in your grocery store simply because it's, it, it, it uh, goes mushy pretty quickly. So you- Bruises. Pick, yeah, bruises. You gotta pick it and eat it pretty much right away. So farmer's markets might be your best bet. I've never seen it at a farmer's market. And, but uh, I don't know if anybody knows one, feel free to put it in the, in the chat. The other questions about pawpaw though is um, where to get the seedlings, but other people have answered that. So um, yeah, a lot of specialty places, Carolinian Canada, I think, but a lot of native plant um, nurseries now are now selling pawpaws. So how, how old does it have to be before it starts fruiting? Like how big or how many years? I believe it's three to five. I'd have to double check. We've we've had ours for a bit. And there's one, we actually have a community garden uh, with Project Share down the road. They have pawpaw trees as well, but I believe it's three to five. But correct me if I'm wrong, pawpaw experts in the group. <laughs> uh, yeah, three to five is about right, somebody says. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have three in my yard and they don't seem to have grown. They still leaf out every year, but they still have stayed the same height as when I planted them five years ago. So I don't know if it's happening there. <laughs> well, I guess. Do they get full sun or is, um, it, is it a sun thing or? They get definitely the morning sun and then they're hidden from the afternoon sun by a plum tree, but they're just, okay. yeah, I don't know, they've grown about three inches in five years, so. Oh. <laughs> oh dear yeah um yep and somebody says it's got a chemical makeup so most pests will stay away and i think that is true it is uh pretty pest free yeah and definitely a benefit of choosing your your native plants they they sort of are adapted to our environment and our pests now we are seeing pests being introduced um but yeah that's awesome Yes, and somebody also mentioned you need to plant two or more to improve the pollination. Um, so somebody asked, did you need a male and a female? It's not so much that, it's just you need more than one from a different um, colony, don't you? So that they can pollinate each other? Yes, yeah. And you said you had three, um, but yeah, if, if you have a couple, and again, it can't be the suckers of, of the one, um, then that helps with pollination for sure. Um, and if you're, that's the thing. So apple trees, you can plant an apple in your backyard. It needs other apple trees, but a lot of people have apple trees. It's common. So you get that naturally in a, in a neighborhood or community pawpaw. It's becoming more common, um, but not all your neighbors will have it yet. Yeah, it can't be the same variety as somebody said, because that means they're just clones. Absolutely right. That's what I was yes. trying to say. So exactly right. So you need two wild from seed or just two named varieties. And they do have to be planted within a certain distance of each other too. They don't have a big span, unlike apple trees or which are pretty small. Um, all right, Thank, yeah, I mean, earlier today we had a talk where somebody mentioned pawpaws and there was just a flood of questions, so. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. They're definitely our, our poster child uh, native fruit tree. I think they're the only ones, so. Um, beautiful, beautiful plant. Okay, and I'm going to sort of conclude the last section of this presentation. It just includes two plants, um, but they're weeds. And we don't, you don't want to plant these weeds intentionally, necessarily. Um, but these are weeds that you might commonly see in your vegetable garden or in your perennial garden. And you might think, I'm just going to throw them out. Um, but I'm here to provide a small little voice being like, hey, you can actually use those weeds. Um, so the first weed 
Um, and a weed is just a plant that we don't want. So this doesn't have to be a weed. We can view it as a lovely edible plant. Um, but this plant here is lamb's quarter. Chenopodium album is the botanical name. Um, you'll find it growing in hot, dry areas. So you'll find it growing in areas where other plants can't grow. Um, and you'll typically see this weed pop up and, and sort of fill if you just had a new build or a uh, new foundation put in that, that sort of crusty soil that's there, this, this plant will grow there. It, it really likes these harsh conditions. Um, so lamb's quarters is cool because you can eat the leaves of this plant, um, either raw in a salad or cooked and you would eat it sort of similar to how you would eat spinach. Um, and similar to spinach, the younger leaves are nicer to eat for sure. So you can pinch off the leaves or pinch off different branches um, at the beginning of the year and then make sure you get the new growth if you're harvesting it, pardon me, later in the year. Um, so I have eaten it, the leaves. Um, one thing I haven't tried yet, and perhaps it's because I didn't let it go to seed because I didn't want more of these plants, but if you let this plant go to seed, um, you can eat the seeds. You can sprout the seeds yourself and eat them as little sprouts or microgreens. Um, and then I haven't done this again, but I read that you can also make porridge out of it. But again, I haven't done the porridge. I did the raw in a salad and then the cooked in a stir fry. Um, and it, it was great and it was, I was picking it anyway. So I added it um, to our summer meals. Um, so when you are harvesting it, because it does grow in those locations that tend to be neglected, um, you wanna make sure you know the location. So don't harvest it if it's next to sort of a public space that might have uh, dogs in the area or um, you don't know if there's been any chemicals used in the area. So I would probably only recommended, recommend harvesting this if it's in your own backyard and you know what's going on there. Um, and a fun fact about this plant is it's actually grown as a crop for a food in India. Um, and again, it's used similar to spinach, but because it's such a hardy plant, it grows in those dry, hot areas. Um, it's sort of a way to get food without having to baby a plant because it comes up whether you want it or not. And that's lamb's quarters. Okay, so if there's no questions about lamb's quarters, maybe it's new to you. It's a cool plant. It's got a tiny bit of a fuzzy leaf, um, but look it up. It's, it's a neat one and you might find it next time you're, you're weeding your garden. We have a few people who have tried it and they said it's very tasty raw. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. So I'd be curious um, if anybody's tried portulaca or common purslane. Um, this weed was the bane of my existence in my vegetable garden because every time you'd scuffle it or you'd take a Dutch hoe to it and you break off the tiny little succulent like leaves, it just propagates itself. It's, it's like any other succulent. You take a leaf off and it sends out roots. Um, so it is, you don't want to plant this on purpose. It's really hard to get rid of once you've got it. Um, it's got a red, thick, fleshy stem and then thick succulent type leaves. Um, but if you do have this plant and if you are picking it out of your garden because it is commonly known as a weed, Again, a weed is only if you don't want it there. Um, you can use it in salads so you can eat it fresh. I would probably rinse it off because it does tend to grow along the ground. However, it can grow up to 40 centimeters high, um, but it tends to sort of hug the ground. So you wanna rinse it to get any soil off. Um, so it's used as salad, greens, garnish. You can cook it into soups and stews and it's uh, really rich in omega-3s and fatty acids. Um, and yeah, you'll find it a lot in, at least I find it a lot in my vegetable garden. Um, and the big thing with this one, and again, I haven't seen its lookalike plant, which is marked down here in the bottom right corner. 
The lookalike plant for this is hairy stemmed spurge. Um, difference being, instead of that smooth red stem, the hairy stemmed spurge has a hairy stem. Um, so you do not want to, you want to, similar to mushrooms and any other plant, uh, you want to make sure you have a positive ID on it first um, because the hairy stem spurge, um, it is a toxic plant. Um, when you break open a portulaca stem or leaf, um, it'll be a clear liquid that comes out. The hairy stem spurge, uh, the liquid is a milky sort of latex type liquid. Um, so that's another sort of in your face warning sign. It's got the hairy stem and it's got a milky liquid like any milky latex liquids. Um, you don't want that touching your skin or staying on your skin. Um, and you definitely don't, wouldn't want to eat that one. Um, but the portulaca, which is all that I've ever seen growing in my garden, um, is, is quite delicious in a salad or as a garnish or cooked down. And that's what I have for portulaca or purslane. Uh, yeah, and people say it's growing quite vigorously in their driveway or their garden or, <laughs> yeah, everywhere, basically. Um, people want to know if you can eat the stem as well of purslane. Yeah, yeah, you can. The leaves are definitely a little bit nicer, but you can, yeah. Um, yeah, and people are saying this was a very interesting talk and the choice of edibles is very inspiring. If there was more time, I wonder what might else have been added. So yeah. Um, Amazing. Oh, somebody wanted to clarify. The toxic one is the one that has a milky sap. Yes. C correct, yeah. Bottom right corner, it's called hairy stemmed spurge. So it's got the milky sap and it's got a, a very hairy stem on it. All right, well, this has uh, been absolutely fascinating. I think everybody else can agree who's here tonight that this is, uh, yeah, people are saying thank you very much. I'll definitely check it out. Um, this is, yeah, huge, hugely fascinating, this talk about what you can eat when you didn't even know. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy people enjoyed it. And um, I, just as much I love hearing about different gooseberries that people are are eating and trying and and the fridge hedge um beaut I love the idea of sharing um so hopefully we can continue to do that in person and network and make friends and and share pawpaws etc <laughs> yes. that's what I would like to do I'd like someone to share their pawpaws with me since mine aren't growing so <laughs> um oh now they're coming in fast and furious do you happen to know what leaf discoloration on lamb's quarter could mean? So this person has seen one with pink leaves and they don't know if that still means it's edible or if that means there's something wrong with it. Um, I know it turns a little bit of a color when it gets a frost. I don't know if it was in colder weather, um, but yeah, I couldn't tell you exactly. I would, I would look it up um, and you might find that it's a tip, uh, a typical nutrient deficiency. Sometimes phosphorus, it'll turn like a purplish. So if it's sort of purplish, maybe it's phosphorus. Yeah, that's uh, probably. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I found that uh, absolutely fabulous. I will be going back and watching this again and making notes and because I've been going through the questions and trying to pay attention and I'm like, oh, oh, but that's so interesting. But what about this one? <laughs> so uh, awesome. hopefully, Everybody else has made notes. And if not, this recording will be available on our Halton Garden Week website. I put the um, link in the chat function if you want to copy that for later or if you already know what our website is. Uh, and just before everybody goes, so I took everybody who entered for the family membership at the Oakville Horticultural Society. And uh, in the order that you direct messaged me and said that you wanted to be entered, put it in the random number generator on my phone and I came up with Robert McLaren. You are our winner. So Robert, if you could get hold of me, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and if you could send me a message and I will have your email and I can pass it on to the Horticultural Society and they can give you your free membership. But if you did not win, do not worry. There are going to be three other memberships that they're going to give away, one for each day of our Halton Garden Week. So enter again, uh, you'll have to attend all the talks and see which one they're, we're gonna give away, uh, which talk we're gonna give away a membership. So make sure you check them all out.
but we're very pleased everybody could join us tonight. And don't forget, we do have a full lineup tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. So thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks again, Lisa. And I'm so sorry for pronouncing your name wrong at the beginning. Oh, oh no worries. <laughs> Should have checked that before I started. <laughs> no worries. It's a tricky one. <laughs> but thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you all. Have a great evening. And thank you so much, Helen and Halton Environmental Network and Food Council for organizing this all. This is fantastic. Yeah, it's been a great, great week and lots to come still. Mm -hmm. There, I think it's just us left. Yeah, so and I'll stop recording.